I'm gonna come right out and start with this. Rift Apart may just be the strongest game in Ratchet & Clank's two-decade history. I'm not ready to say just yet that it is the best one outright, time and probably 40 or 50 more playthroughs will tell, but I want you to understand just what kind of game we're dealing with here. If you've had any concerns or reservations with this game, drop them, because it feels like Insomniac has addressed almost every criticism that they've heard about any of the prior games in this series. Rift Apart sets a new high watermark for the franchise's ever-evolving gameplay. It has just about unmatched pacing. It features a soundtrack that feels at least a little bit memorable for the first time since at least 2007, and although the story may not top the list of best Ratchet stories, it's a simple one told incredibly well, likely the easiest to understand multiverse story that I can recall in media. You can tell that this is the game that they've been itching to make for a decade, and they did not miss. After two full playthroughs and getting this game's Platinum Trophy, I only have a few critiques of the PS5's marquee title, so few that it surprised even me, the guy that spent five hours analyzing the first three Ratchet games. And we'll get into those critiques and much more in a bit, but first, full disclosure, an early copy of Rift Apart was provided by PlayStation 4 Review, like... Uh, uh, two days ago, give or take. At the time of writing, it's Friday afternoon, and outside of maxing out some weapons, I 100% completed this game in a single sitting. That's not to say that the game is short, though. Make no mistake, this is going to run you anywhere from, I would say, 10 to 20 hours for your first playthrough, depending on the difficulty that you're playing on and how much of the optional content you choose to seek out. That would make it, if not the longest traditional Ratchet game, second place by only a matter of minutes. And thankfully, the New Game Plus weapon progression and difficulty scaling feels incredibly balanced this time around, meaning that this is a three-playthrough game if you want to max every weapon out. The game will take you across about ten major levels, with a few of them getting multiple revisits, and one of these is the largest level in the entire Ratchet & Clank franchise. However, I won't be showing that level or much beyond what's already been shown off prior to release for the sake of spoilers. You may see some later game weapons in the arena or in my challenge mode playthrough in this video, but I won't be talking about the plot in more than broad strokes so that you can experience it for yourself. The game, as you probably know, opens up with Clank gifting Ratchet a repaired Dimensionator so that Ratchet can find the rest of his species, the Lombaxes. At least, that's the reason Clank gives, but I think he just wants Ratchet out of the house after a decade of retirement. In usual Ratchet & Clank fashion, things quickly go awry when Dr. Nefarious shows up from an even longer retirement to steal it. In the ensuing battle, the device breaks and opens up rifts in the space-time continuum, and the three are warped into a parallel dimension, one where Nefarious is the emperor of the entire universe. With the fabric of every reality at risk, it's up to the now unretired Ratchet and & Clank and our new protagonist Rivet to stop Nefarious and prevent the dimensions from imploding. I came out of my time with Rift Apart beyond impressed by the game's ability to mesh the more serious storytelling and characterization that was featured in the PlayStation 3 Ratchet titles, and the sometimes crass, more adult humor found much more in the PS2 saga. This is, in my opinion, the funniest Ratchet game since at least Deadlocked, and that humor is sprinkled in well enough that it never detracts from the high stakes. Whether it's our heroes chatting mid-fight and occasionally making quips, or some passers-by offering to... I Ratchet? I laughed more playing Rift Apart than I have in a long time with this series. But more than that, I'm amazed at how well our new hero Rivet is meshed into the picture. This Lombax is her dimension's parallel equivalent to Ratchet, and she ends up finding Clank right at the start of the game when the robot is injured and separated from his pal. Right from the outset, we're shown that Rivet is a fully formed, fully developed character who's had probably a dozen major adventures of her own rather than being some plucky newcomer. I will say that there's a smidge of tell-don't-show at times when it comes to establishing her character, given that they had to get her up to speed in her five to six hours of the game. For example, her neighbors on Planet Sargasso, a species known as the Morts, constantly praise Rivet for being so helpful and cool and awesome and nice, but then they're all portrayed with a really thick Minnesota accent, so they might actually just be that nice. It's a pretty good save. The more cynical folks out there may latch onto that as a negative, so prepare yourself for that discourse in like a year's time, but Rivet is undeniably the star of the show in Rift Apart far more often than not. It helps that the game does take place in her dimension, so she is right at home and interacting with her realm's parallels to characters that we've grown to know and love over the course of a dozen games. 
And yet she's not just a cookie cutter ratchet, she has her own characterization, including having incredible amounts of trust issues, having fought against Emperor Nefarious' troops and his iron-fisted rule as a leader of the resistance, no relation. So at first she's ready to dismantle Clank thinking that he's a nefarious warbot before eventually coming to her senses and realizing no, he's not lying, he really is from another dimension. More importantly, she never feels like she outclasses Ratchet or Clank, despite being our playable hero for about half of this adventure, thanks to this game's stellar, 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 stellar pacing. Throughout Rift Apart, you'll be given a choice of which planet to travel to next, between one Ratchet level and one Rivet level, with both levels taking place at around the same time off-screen from one another. Since both of our heroes share progression on their weapon experience and health, it never actually feels like you're going back and forth between two distinct gameplay styles, as had been attempted in previous games like Crack in Time. Instead here, we have constant forward momentum, and I can't understate how much of an improvement this is to me over a game like Crack in Time, the last full Ratchet game that we got way back in 2009. In that game, Ratchet and Clank are also separated, and although I loved both Ratchet and Clank's separate gameplay styles and their own levels, the constant back and forth took me out of a flow state right as either part was starting to get really good. Here in Rift Apart, regardless of whether we're in a linear level or an open one, if we're solving puzzles or blasting baddies, I did not leave my flow state at any point except for the occasional death or bug. In other words, I played this game from start to 100% completion in one almost unbroken flow state. I have never in my life had that happen in a game this length before. Rift Apart takes no time telling you what kind of game it is either, and it refuses to milk the same separation angle that Ratchet and Clank has done before. Just after Rivet's first level, Clank and Ratchet re-establish contact with one another. Rivet meets the first other Lombax she's ever seen, and Ratchet meets... well... Well, the third. Despite being what could have been a complicated, messy multiverse story, it's incredibly easy to follow, so much so that you'll see some of the main story beats coming pretty far in advance. I fully expect that there will be some fans upset about certain plot choices. For example, I'm not in love with Dr. Nefarious being, yet again, a total joke throughout, by the way, I called that a year ago, but at least this time he's a much funnier joke than during his last villain roles. In Rift's case, this simpler story works greatly to the game's benefit. As a lean, overarching plot, it allows us the time to develop Rivet's personality in full, and surprisingly, add even more development for both Ratchet and Clank, two characters whose story arcs have been more or less finished for a long, long while. All of our protagonists complement one another so well, and the simple story has the added benefit of giving new players a foothold so they're not lost in the shuffle. Don't be worried about it being too sanitized for new players if you're a longtime fan, though, because the game has a lot for you to chew on. It answers just about every, hey, where's this character question that you might have, and it sets up a bright future for this series, if you know what I mean, and that's all I can ask. Regardless of if you're a newcomer or a series veteran, this gameplay loop is full stop the most satisfying Ratchet & Clank has ever had, so you are in for a fantastic time. The enemies are far more aggressive, chasing you across chasms relentlessly onto platforms. The very fabric of existence itself cannot stop these goons from chasing and getting to you. More enemies than ever will flood the screen. On harder difficulties, they're more likely to attack you from off-screen rather than waiting until they're on screen or telegraphing like in previous games. They'll try to surround you, and the hail of bullet fire coming your way may and very likely will just overwhelm you. This won't be unbearable if you play on normal or below, but on harder difficulties, Rift Apart is going to challenge you. It is going to kick your ass, and you are going to love every second of it. Thanks to the addition of the new Rift Tether, you can pull yourself into certain dimensional rifts from across the battlefield in real time to get away or find a vantage point, and the Phantom Dash gives you a proper dodge move with invincibility frames because just side flipping is not gonna cut it anymore. Interestingly, enemies, at least on higher difficulties, run faster than Ratchet or Rivet, sort of like the Tremor enemies in Ratchet Deadlocked, except this time, that was an intentional design choice instead of an oversight to ensure that you constantly have to reposition to avoid getting overtaken. The Phantom Dash and Hover Boots both do an excellent job giving you some distance when you do need it, and all of this in tandem means that you are not going to play Rift Apart the same way that you have most other Ratchet games. 
Insomniac clearly planned for that, of course, and you'll eventually have half a dozen specialty weapons for more strategic gameplay styles on top of the dozen regular weapons that you would have as well. Against some of the game's frequent mini-bosses, there were times where I was actively swapping between five or six weapons to freeze enemies in place, distract them, stun them, freeze them again, but this time it's inside a shrub, all while phantom dashing back and forth between bullet fire from both the mini-boss and the barrages of secondary goons that'll try to catch you off guard. The arsenal's highlights include a shield gun that will absorb enemy bullets and fire them right back in a shotgun blast, an homage to a similar gun from Insomniac's failed EA game Fuse, and Mr. Fungi, a mushroom that follows you around and shoots enemies for a short time. Mr. Fungi is a replacement for the quippy Mr. Zircon that a vocal chunk of fans had started to tire of. So, instead of talking about how strong he is like Zircon did, Mr. Fungi doesn't talk much at all because he's depressed and doesn't want to be there, kind of like a sad clown. It's… it's actually pretty amazing. Don't Stop Moving has been the go-to strategy for pretty much the entire franchise outside of the first game, but unlike most Ratchet titles, you can't just strafe left or right constantly in Rift Apart because enemies lead their shots and they lead them well. Playing this like a classic Ratchet game will get you hit time and time again. And, since Ratchet's one of the first big showcases of the PS5 hardware, most weapons make use of the DualSense's haptic triggers, where a partial press will fire in one way, but a full press leads to a different effect. In practice, many of these challenge you to pay full attention to what you're doing while keeping tabs on the 40 enemies trying to demolish you and all the bullets that you're dodging between as well. Holding down R2 halfway often makes the weapon's effect stronger, such as revving up a minigun or charging a giant laser. In the heat of battle, Rift Apart challenges you to be better and keep focusing rather than tuning out and spraying and praying, and it's such a small touch that I think many players will end up missing if I don't call it out. Once you get into the groove with Rift Apart's combat, there are few games out there, period, that will feel better. There are only three things that I don't love about this arsenal of weapons. One, despite being incredibly varied and useful, the weapon names are oddly bland compared to previous games. It's, it's just kind of weird to see. Two, the ricochet is one of the coolest concepts I've seen for a Ratchet & Clank weapon, letting you fire a single shot and then press R2 multiple times as it bounces back and forth, homing in and attacking the enemy again and again with even stronger force. However, it has a bad penchant for getting stuck after an attack, and it just kind of hovers there for a few moments before it finds its target again. This means that you're a sitting duck while you wait for that bullet to find its mark, which defeats the whole purpose of the weapon causing hit stun on enemies. I'm assuming and hoping that this one's going to be patched pretty quickly, as it seems like it's just one of those last-minute bugs that sort of pops up. And more importantly, number three, the stronger weapons such as the returning Warmonger Rocket Launcher or even the Rhino Super Weapon aren't actually that effective against bosses or later enemies. Many of these guns will only deal at most 6% of a boss's total health, and even the Rhino at most has only done 12%, and it feels like sometimes the Rhino's explosion just misses bosses. I went down to normal difficulty at one point to verify that this wasn't just a difficulty scaling thing, and nope, for some reason the bigger guns just ended up being balanced to be a bit weaker against bosses, I'm assuming to keep you constantly switching like the game always intends for you to do. If that's the case, I do understand the intent, and I love the gimmick of this rhino pulling bombs or characters from other dimensions and PlayStation franchises, that part is amazing. But when regular armored enemies survive the shot, that gun feels a little underwhelming. I've yet to do a full playthrough on anything lower than hard though, so that might change when I do, and trust me, that will inevitably happen soon. One of my favorite moments playing Rift Apart is actually an entire full hour of gameplay, because almost every major game mechanic that Ratchet has ever had meshed in with the massive open terrain on planet Savali. You're tasked with freeing three groups of monks trapped by Nefarious' troops, all spread on opposite corners of the planet, and this is where you'll obtain Ratchet's new hover boots. Well, they're not new, but this pair specifically is new to him because they now have a speed booster by pressing the triggers a few times while hovering. Sprinkled around Savali are micro-challenges, think shrines from Breath of the Wild, except these are Lombax shrines that house data archives and some of the Lombax lore that players have been craving since the PlayStation 3 days. Some of these shrines won't activate until you defeat the enemies that are placed nearby. Others ask you to chase a moving nefarious transporter around the map in an awesome nod to the chase missions from Insomniac Spyro games way back 25 years ago. I could not stop myself from exploring the map and finding all of them before I continued, while making sure along the way to stop and obliterate any nefarious forces trying to loot the planet. 
The broken terrain and fallen monuments make for awesome, visually distinct battlefields during the main mission here, and the hover boots have never felt so fun to use. Between the hover boots and the extra air you get with the Phantom Dash, there are points both here and throughout the game where you can just skip a swing shot target. I've sort of just sequence broken, gotten gold bolts in completely different ways than were intended. The movement here is just about perfected, and that's saying a lot since it was already pretty much perfect in prior games. There are just so many little, and some not so little moments on Savali that I want to talk about, but I just can't, and this is essentially only level 3. Even on replay, when I didn't have to go for all of those secrets, Planet Savali was remarkably paced on just the main story path, refusing to drag or lose its weight like I was worried that it might. It's really here where it sinks in that Rift Apart has got something for every Ratchet & Clank fan out there. As always, the reward loop for your weapons is beyond satisfying. That's where Ratchet & Clank makes its money, of course. Weapons level up as you damage enemies from level 1 to 5, at which point they'll gain a new name and a secondary effect. Along the way, their damage will increase with each incremental level, and you'll unlock new tiles on the game's secondary upgrade tree, which spends rare titanium that you'll find out in the field. Those of you that played Tools of Destruction into the Nexus or the PS4 game will remember this raritanium tree well. Like in some of the more recent games, Insomniac has been thoughtful enough to give you multiple weapons in a similar style, so that right as you might be close to maxing out, say, your first blaster, you'll be able to purchase the Lightning Rod, which is another blaster that has a stun effect, and when that one's nearly maxed out, you'll get the Buzz Blades. It may sound redundant here, but they each have a slightly different utility that keeps any gun from feeling like a weird reskin, and every gun is surprisingly viable throughout the entire game. There is no Lancer Syndrome where your first gun is super weak and useless by the end. I will say that the increased difficulty makes the health upgrade system a bit more noticeable and maybe a bit problematic. In every game up to into the Nexus, you would upgrade your health in single unit increments, and when your health leveled up, it would refill and a white flash would damage all nearby enemies. It was a bonus, a way to save you when you were in a pinch, but from Into the Nexus onward, the experience meter for health takes longer to top off, but you get 10 more nanotech from each level up. I don't recall that ever being an issue in Nexus or in the PS4 game, but here, I found myself hoping that I would get health upgrades sooner or more frequently, rather than finding myself pleasantly surprised that the meter topped off and saved me when I was in a pinch. I think if enemies are going to be this aggressive, I would prefer it if the health upgraded twice as frequently but only gave you 5 health per level, just some food for thought. But it's worth noting that the moments where I was begging for a health upgrade to save me mainly came in the game's arena, which has some of the most unique and difficult challenge designs that I could recall. With enemies randomly spawning from rifts on the battlefield's edge, you can't easily predict where to watch out, you can't camp the spawns, you constantly have to be watching your back. With the creative arena layouts, this made for a perfect primer to polish your skills and feel awesome while doing it. I just kinda wish the arena bosses weren't reskins of bosses that you fought during the main game. Like with every other critique I have with Rift Apart, it's not a big deal, just a missed opportunity for even more improvement. But for any of these nitpicks that I do have, there are at least one or two features that are a massive improvement from previous games. The armor system, for example, allows you to mix and match armor, and makes armor pieces collectibles themselves rather than making a whole set a purchasable upgrade. You can even customize the color scheme of each armor piece to your liking, or just not wear any armor at all with no damage penalty. The rewards for collecting the hidden gold bolts are some of the best that any Ratchet game has had. No more are the days where all you get for finding secrets is big head mode and some screen filters. We have several really fun new reskins for Ratchet's wrench, Rivet's hammer, and for the bolts you collect themselves, along with many others that I don't want to spoil for those that are going to get everything. Getting new armor pieces is always a blast, because often they're rewards in these pocket dimension platforming challenges that are hidden throughout many of the game's levels. And the levels themselves are just amazing. I was worried that a few of them would maybe feel gimmicky on later playthroughs, but they were still just as fun on the second go-round, because the game rarely forces you to go at a set pace or any slow walking or waiting moments. There's just something about warping between two different variations of a level across dimensions in real time that never gets old, and I would love to see that gimmick expanded in future titles. In fact, two of my three favorite levels in the game are this sort of level, because they find a way to not only feel different from pretty much any of the hundred planets we've seen in Ratchet before, but still feel fun and familiar enough while doing it. 
Obviously, I could talk in detail about how this game looks absolutely stunning, but you can see that clear as day, so I'm not going to waste your time. Just know that you're going to stop yourself countless times and do those dumb E3 trailer shots where somebody stops and pans across the horizon. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen a lot. I played my first run on the 4K 30 frame per second fidelity mode, which is the footage you'll be seeing for this video because, hey, I recorded 200 gigs of footage and I would like to use it. And then my challenge mode run, I played on the performance ray tracing mode that was added in the day one patch, which is closer to 1080p but runs a smooth 60 frames per second, and for just about everybody, I would say go with the performance RT mode. Like, load the game up every now and then and just see it at 4K just to admire it, but you'll be lying if you say you notice a difference that isn't immediately offset by the more responsive frame rate. More importantly, the soundtrack actually feels like it's pretty strong after the last several game had solid but kind of forgettable atmospheric orchestral scores. That is, these songs are good when you can hear it. Make sure you adjust your audio mix a bit so the music comes out a little bit louder. I was worried that it was a bit on the forgettable side myself when I first played, but when listening to the tracks on their own, I quite liked them, so I think it's just a really bad mixing choice. The best place to see this is at the bar, which has a jukebox full of club beats that you just can't actually hear in-game because of all the talking and sound effects going on around you. It's realistic, don't get me wrong, but I'm not really playing a game about dimension-hopping cats for realism. I would rather hear the tunes just a smidge more. But that's solvable, and again, just like about every other nitpick I've had, they're just that. Nitpicks. I could dig into other gameplay facets, like the Schrodinger's Clank puzzles or the glitch missions, and lament that there are only about ten of them throughout the game between both of these styles, but that decision clearly came to preserve the game's flow while spicing up beyond the usual gunplay. I get it. I could say that I missed the gadgets in this game since there really aren't any besides the Rift Heather and the Swing Shot, but I genuinely didn't notice until New Game Plus because the game is just that fun even without them. I could say I wanted a better platforming combat balance, but I didn't because the combat is so enthralling and there are more than enough platforming sections tossed at just the right time every time. I could talk in far more granular detail about the story, and believe me, that day will come, but I had pretty much no problems with it because characters matter more than story, and this is the best that most of these characters have been in a long time, if not ever. I kept worrying in the back of my mind that this game wouldn't stick the landing, that it couldn't be this solid the whole way through, and it was. I was worried that it would be short, it wasn't. So while I can't say for sure that this is, in my opinion, the best Ratchet & Clank game yet, it's probably only a matter of time, and this comes from somebody who outright refuses to rank these games because they change all the time, because I love all of them like children except for Size Matters. The words, best Ratchet game, would not leave my lips right now even as a possibility if it wasn't this good. Even as I write this, or as I record this, or as I edit this, right this moment, I want to play it a third time instead of working on a video about it, to see even more of what I've missed, the little nods to the older games, the love that has been put in. I want to improve my skills even more so I can keep my 20 times bolt multiplier for more than a few moments, because good god, this game comes for your throat. It's amazing. It's all amazing. When you have the chance, buy it. Play it for yourself. I don't see a world where anybody except the most cynical of players will disagree. If you've already played Rift Apart, make sure to give your spoiler-free thoughts in the comments below. And if you're new here and want to watch even more Ratchet & Clank stuff, I've made a bunch of Ratchet & Clank videos. In fact, I've released three feature-length retrospectives this year covering each of the games in the original Ratchet trilogy, the definitive way to look at those games, learn about their development, and what went right and wrong in each one. Plus, you can subscribe and help the channel grow and all that fun stuff, since probably maybe 10% of you watching right now are even subscribed. Or, or not, if you don't want to. I don't really care. You being here is more than enough. And I'd like to give a special thanks to my wonderful Patreon supporters for their incredible generosity, including Goldstorm07, Vincent, Anon42, Calico Plus, Harry, James Boss, Terminally Nerdy, Wolf Chaosan, and Buckles Chucklow. That list is getting longer every single week, wow. And if you want your name on this list, or you want access to the exclusive Golden Bolt Discord server, behind the scenes info, and input on upcoming projects, or anything like that, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. As always, until the next video, stay golden.